Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord on high. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. We're in a series of messages called What About? Oh, you've got questions. He's got the answers. Best place to look for the answers is in the Word of God. Amen. Of course, the, you know, we're living in a, word, in a world today that doesn't necessarily agree with that. But the Word of God has been tried and is still very true. We talked about uh, issues of purity and morality last week and dealt with a lot of relationships prior to a, in the issues of morality prior to marriage, fornication. What does the Bible have to say? Of course, we're living in a culture that really doesn't care what the Bible says in regard to those either. But we want to know what Scripture teaches because that's where we find life and that's where we find the grace of God. Today, we're to be dealing with the issue of adultery. An important issue that today I think is uh, pretty much an acceptable in the status quo. We want to see what the Bible has to say. I, I don't really believe for anybody that has been a Christian and had to experience this either from one side of it or the other either way. It's not going to feel uh, some, some kind of uh, twinges today as we talk about this topic. It's not, a, it's not an acceptable topic in most church pulpits because it does create uh, tension. Uh, in fact, I was told by one of our guests at the last campus that uh, it scared them. I said, I'm kind of a scary guy anyway, so I, <laughs> I understand that completely. But we do want to talk about, these are the important things we need to deal with as a culture because we're so inundated with uh, the opposite mindset and a philosophy that excludes God and excludes Jesus and excludes the Word of God. So what does the Bible have to say is the important question. So what does the Bible have to say about adultery? Well, let me share with you a couple of statistics, and I want to say something about those statistics as well. Uh, Maggie Scarf wrote a book called Intimate Partners. It was published back in 87, reprinted again in late 96. And she said this, Most experts do consider the educated guess that at the present time, some 50 to 65 percent of husbands... And 45 to 55 percent of wives become extramaritally involved by the age of 40 to be the relatively sound and a reasonable one. Now that was in the 90s. And by the way, when I began to research some of these statistics and look for current statistics, I really didn't find anything past 2003. Like there really hadn't been any statistical studies going on. And I think that's because you can't even keep up with it. Part of the reason. Peggy Vaughn, another author called, of the book called The Monogamy Myth, it was first published uh, in 89 and republished in 2003. She said, conservative infidelity statistics estimate that 60% of men and 40% of women will have an extramarital affair. Now, both of those statistics I showed you represent numbers that were over a decade ago. Most statisticians believe that those numbers have escalated enormously, percentage-wise, due to the fact that the culture has changed so radically. The mindset towards a, uh, immorality is so open anymore, so they say it's probably somewhat higher. So, for instance, the continuing increase of women in the workplace, uh, the continuing increase of women having affairs on the Internet, all those things coupled together said that uh, probably the relationship between men and women is not any difference. Probably about 60% of men and 60% of women are either involved in an extramarital affair or have had an extramarital affair. It's just so common in the culture today. I mean, uh, it, it, those in this room, those out of this room, our fans, our, our friends, our families, we've all seen this happen in the world around us. But remember what the Bible says in the seventh commandment in simple language, in five words, it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Pretty simple. In fact, the, in fact the, we call it the Ten Commandments. Literally, it's called the Decalogue in the Old Testament, meaning, meaning the ten words. And the word here from Exodus 20 would be no adultery, really is one word. It's just in the Hebrew language, but it's literally what it means, no adultery. Now, understand that God gives us these words, and he gives us his commandments, and he gives us his principles uh, for a reason, all right? So whenever you, uh, God gives us a negative like this, you need to understand there's always a positive purpose behind it. You know, when he says, thou shalt com not commit adultery, his purpose behind these words is not to cause us pain in some regard, but it's really there for our protection. You as a parent, you young children in your family, in your home, you, you give some guidelines, you don't cross the street, you don't play over here, you, you go here, you don't play with scissors, you don't run knives, and without supervision. They're all there to protect your children. Well, God's given us his word, ultimately, not to make some kind of laundry list of this is what I don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, but they're there to protect your life because it is in the plan of God and in the mind of God for you to have the fullest, most meaningful, purposeful life that you can experience. Jesus made it clear when he said, 
I've come, you might have life and that life more abundantly. That's the kind of life that God has for you. So don't be, uh, don't be duped by it so many times when you see negatives in scriptures, they're really positives. And positive, especially in this regard, because nothing destroys a family faster than adultery. I mean, even the mention of this word causes pain for some folks, memories of shame for many people. So the purpose of the message today is not to resurrect some old thing from the past, all right, unless it still hasn't been dealt with. God wants you to get right with him. But it's really to bring you to a place to get your heart right with God, to protect your life, to keep you out of harm's way, for you to focus on the present, to focus on the future, because God is certainly not some kind of killjoy. I mean, that's Satan's favorite tactic, isn't it? He used it on Eve in the garden. It's nothing new. Satan comes to Eve and says, you know, God doesn't want you to experience this or whatever it might be. God doesn't want you to know what this is like. God doesn't want you to have, and that's the way he works today. You get right with God, Satan says. You may be thinking it's you, but obviously the Bible lets us know where the battle is. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, if I really get right with God, I, I'm not going to experience life and I'm not going to have any fun. And where does that come from? It's the same old tactic that the enemy's been using for centuries and centuries and centuries. Don't believe it. God has the best in store for you. God has the best in mind for you. And God gives us great gifts. We talked last week about how our life is made up of a lot of drives and, you know, desires. And God wants us to satisfy these desires and these drives that he's given us in a God-given way. Satan wants us to satisfy these drives and desires in a God-forbidden way. That's why the Bible says, when every man is tempted, he's drawn away of his desires. Satan wants you to satisfy these, these appetites in your life in a way that will not bring glory to God or will not benefit you. Now, we know the Bible tells us there's pleasure in sin for a season, but remember, that's a very short season. When God gives us these things, he has a way for us to satisfy them. We talked about how God given us a, a hunger drive. You know, you can satisfy that in a righteous way or an unrighteous way. You can become a glutton or anorexic or bulimic or whatever. You can, you can satisfy that in all the ways that God forbids. All right? Or you can realize it's a blessing from God and taste and food and those things, you know, can be righteously enjoyed. It's the same thing with a sex drive. You know, it can be satisfied in a righteous manner and a righteous way. Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God's given us this gift, but it's kind of like water. You know, water is a great thing. Too much water, you drown. Fire was the illustration we used last week. Fire is a beautiful thing. Fire is a marvelous thing. Fire is a, a tremendous advantage to have fire, but it can either warm you or it can burn you. It all gets down how you choose to handle what God has given you. God says the way to satisfy this desire in a righteous way, in a God-glorifying way, and a way to experience the fullest enjoyment from it is in marriage. So I want to look at some things today and, 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 and talk about the obvious things about from the definition and the, the, the destruction. All those things we'll talk about as we describe what it means and what God's doing in our lives to teach us these important principles in regard to adultery. One is, let's talk about the definition first and foremost. In defining it, you need to understand that first and foremost... It has to do with a heart problem. I mean, God's not just saying don't commit adultery or don't do this. We want to look at today a closer examination, you know, and, and really look and see what, what's the source of this. How do we define this? Well, Jesus kind of dealt very clearly with this when he started talking about that adultery is really an issue of the heart. In fact, in Matthew 5, when he's given us the scripture, he talks about, listen, that I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already, catch these words, in his heart. The seedbed is the heart. The Bible says from the heart, you know, we need to guard our heart because out of it are the issues of life. Our heart needs to be right with God. Our heart needs to be pure with God. We need to be, we need to be in tune with God so that our hearts doesn't get defiled by the world that we're in. Because if we let defilement come in, if we choose to live with a heart just for ourselves, our own passions, our own desires, then certainly we're going to be defiled. And so the scripture says, hey, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus makes it more than just a, a clear act of externally. He says it is a matter of the heart. Last week, we dealt with this passage of scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to look at just a couple of quick verses because I think it reiterates this issue. This is the will of God, he said. Even your sanctification, talk about purity and holiness, that you should abstain from fornication. 
By that way, it's, it's, it's all sexual sins, what the word means. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which don't know God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. So, as we have also forewarned you and testified, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but God has called us unto holiness. Now, he says a couple things here that deal with the internal man. All right? This act of adultery first is formed in the mind and the heart. So he says, first of all, he says, you need to know how to possess your own vessel. And we talked about the stewardship of the body last week. How that God's called us to be in charge of this body and what we do with these passions and, and these desires. That we're called to be managers of it. That the body is for the Lord and the body is not for fornications, Romans says. And 1 Corinthians says, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I have a responsibility to manage what goes on in this vessel here and this temple. It says, you need to know how to possess your vessel. And with that, possession of the vessel is that important priority of making sure your heart stays right and in tune and clean and clear with God. He said, make sure that you possess your vessel and don't defraud anyone. Don't cause other people to stumble in their own hearts and minds. You have your life right. You get your heart right and live in such a way that you're not a hindrance to somebody else. So that the way you live and conduct your life is honorable to God and brings glory to God. Jesus kind of tells us this as he goes down to Matthew chapter 5 from where we read a while ago. And he talked about the eyes, remember, if your eye, you know, offends you, then you cut it out. And he talked about if your hand offends you in verse 30, then you, then you cut it off. So you pluck out your eyes and you cut off your hands. Now, again, he's talking about actions that we should take. Not literally to pluck my eyes out. God's given me the way by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to manage, to have discipline in my eyes where I allow my eyes to see and what I allow my eyes to do. Job said it this way, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I look upon a maiden? We have some disciplines that God gives us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to do in our life. But he talks about this issue of defrauding people. With, our, with what we look at, we can be defrauded. So that means the way you dress the way you expose yourself, the way you carry yourself should be in a way that will bring glory to God, not cause people to stumble in their walk with God. He says, in fact, he says, if that's a problem, then you need to take some radical steps. And it is interesting that he talks about eyes and hands because men are mostly stimulated by what they see. That's why the majority of pornography users, even though there are many women, the majority of percentage ranks among men. On the other hand, women are more stimulated by touch. So we have this issue of what we're seeing with our eyes and what we're handling with our hands and how we relate to the Lord in this regard. We need to keep our heart pure. Whatever the cost, we need to be radical in keeping our heart pure. He said abstain from fornication in 1 Thessalonians. He said, you know, not only do you abstain, you possess your vessel and you live in such a way that brings glory to God. I think the obvious thing out of that is, is how we relate to one another, how we speak to one another, how we dress, how we appeal to one another in that regard. Uh, we have a, a new Southern Baptist Convention president, our first African-American president over the Southern Baptist Convention. I love what he said in his church not too long ago, Fred Luter. He said, you know, going to church anymore is kind of like going to Popeye's. All I see is legs, thighs, and breasts. <laughs> Amen. Even at church, people don't take much into consideration. We've lost the context of common sense. You know, we, we, we just go with whatever's fashionable and whatever's acceptable. And the Bible tells us that's not the way we live our life. So we're willing to do whatever God wants us to do. So we need to, we need to realize that the way, we, the way we handle people and touch people and the way we dress and the way we look, the words that we say are all important. Jesus says, hey, you take radical steps to avoid this issue of immorality in your life. The definition goes down to an issue of the heart. The second thing is the deception of adultery. And this is really important. If you fail to deal with these kind of issues in your life correctly, then you're really open for all kinds of deception. Now, the Bible tells us that the heart becomes darkened by sin. Over and over we see that. Here's what happens. When your heart becomes darkened by sin, your mind becomes an open battleground for Satan. And there's so many people that seem to be so overwhelmed with all kinds of temptation because they haven't dealt with the most important thing, and that is who's going to reign in the heart. Will Jesus be Lord and will I choose to glorify him with my life or will I choose to live for myself? The heart is the number one issue of your walk. And it's so important that if you're not cautious, then the heart can easily be deceived. Now, I love this from the New Living Translation from Proverbs 6. It says, but the man who commits adultery is an utter fool and he does what? He destroys himself. Now, there's another more 
uh, I think softer translation of that talks about he that lacketh, you know, he that, he that lacketh wisdom destroys himself when he commits adultery. But the idea here is, is, is an idea of a man who just chooses to live foolishly or a woman who would choose to live foolishly. Why do people do that? How, how do they fall in these kind of traps? How do they get open to these kind of issues? Well, Proverbs 7 puts it this way. In Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 are three chapters I told every parent ought to be going over their young people with. He said, I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youth, a young man void of understanding. Now the word there, void of understanding or simple, is a word which we sometimes would translate naive. It's a Hebrew word, pithe, and it comes from the word patha. And the, the word patha in the Hebrew language has to do with something that's to be open, all right? To, be, to make room for something. To, but basically what's happening here is that, you know, Put it in modern vernacular. I'm open-minded. That's the context of being simple-minded, to be open-minded. But isn't that where the world is today? Oh, you Christians, you need to be op more open-minded. You need to be more tolerant. You need, to, you need to make room for this. And the Bible teaches just the opposite for the Christian. That we're not to be open-minded. We guard our hearts. We guard our minds. We, with diligence, we set a guard up. We, we watch over the things that come into our heart, the things that come over into our mind. We choose to have wisdom and not to be, as it says here, void of understanding. The whole idea here, there's somebody that's open-minded. It is easily enticed. Somebody that's open-minded is easily deluded. Somebody that's open-minded is easily deceived. Now, here's the problem we've talked about before with deception. When you're deceived... You don't know it, which creates a problem, right? <laughs> so if I tell you to say, oh, I'm not deceived, but you have been deceived. How can I avoid deception? Stay out of darkness, stay out of sin. Keep my heart right with God. God gives me light. God gives me light to walk in. God gives me light to live by. God gives me instruction from his word. Now, here's to show you how, how deception enters in. There can be a couple that's happily married, enjoying their life, and then this whole issue starts. Here's how, what happens. Your first kind of goes like this. Oh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. The oh, Bible says it's not okay. Very clearly, no adultery. So how can you say something's okay when it's not okay? Then what's happened? You've been deceived. Your mind has been darkened. What you once had said, no way, now you've made a way. Once you had a mind closed to it, now the mind is open. It's okay. Why? Because everybody else is doing it. Or because it's, I mean, 60% of couples that I have, people in married couples, are, somebody's having a relationship that's not right, you know? And it must be okay because I, there, you know, there's a book out called Fifty Shades of Grey. You know, we, we, Magic Mike's on at the theater, so it's all right for me to go down there. Eh? It's just immorality. And we'll deal more with those kind of issues in a couple of weeks, all right? We're not going to let that go. We're certainly going to deal with those issues. Here's what it says in Proverbs 30. This is the way of the adulterous woman, and it can be the adulterous man. She eats and she wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. What's wrong with that? That's the mindset. So what? It's no big deal. Everybody else will do it. it it's, it's okay. Number two lie comes like this. It, this, meet, this meets a real need in my life. It meets, you know, let me tell you, it does not meet a need in your life. Hosea says they eat, they don't have enough, they commit whoredoms. In other words, they live in immorality. They don't, they're not profit from it because they've left off to take heed to the Lord. The bottom line is this. The wages of sin is death, all right? Mick Jagger had it right when he wrote it 100 years ago now, wasn't it? I can't get no satisfaction because sin brings no satisfaction. Oh yeah, there's pleasure in sin for a season. How long is that? A few months? In fact, it's interesting that I did study in these statistics that most people who had extramarital affairs, they were all short-term relationships, maybe two, three, four months at best because there's no satisfaction. Coming. Less than 10% ever got involved in a relationship of marriage. So it, there's such a farce and there's such a lie to it. There's, there's no real fullness of life that comes up because sin always brings death. It always brings defeat. It always brings separation. It, it's, it, there's something about doing things that are outside of God's will that's diluting. It's like, you know, taking concentrate and you pour water in it to dilute the concentrate. Well, you have this concentrate of life. We called it virtue last week that God's given you. And every time you choose to rebel against God, your own will, your own way, your own mindset, you, what you think is best for your life, it dilutes that. So you don't have the power for living and the character that God wants to build in your life. And this dilution process is constantly taking a place in your life. It doesn't meet a need in your life. Another one is this. Well, we love each other. We love each other. The Bible says that love will cover a multitude of sins, not being 
not be covered under the cover so you can sin. All right. The Bible makes it clear that in 1 Corinthians 13, that, that real love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. All right. It takes no pleasure in sin. It does not act unbecomingly. In other words, the things that are outside what is righteous and right, it doesn't do that. It doesn't, do, do, love doesn't seek its own. It's not selfish. And adultery is one of the highest forms of selfishness that any married person could ever do. But love, real love, doesn't do that. Love, will, love, or, love doesn't take that into, into account for its life. Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. Love rejoices in what is right and what is truthful. But that's not the culture we're living in. Janice Abram Spring, the author of After the Affair, uh, which was a, a Washington Post article back in the decade ago, she said 10% of extramarital affairs, 10% last one day. 10% last more than one day, but less than a month. 50% last more than a month, but less than a year. 40% last two or more years. Few extramarital affairs have lasted more than four years. You know, there's no love in that. Love is when that person's willing to say to the other person, I'm sacrificing my will for you. You're first, you're most important, you and I are now one. And I'll love you like myself, and you're going to love me like yourself, and we two are no longer two, but now we are one. Amen. Don't believe the lies. I've had people come in and say, well, Brother Joe, I just don't know. I just, you know, I love this woman, and I, and I love my wife. Can you imagine? I, I thought about it. Let me go try that with Kathy. <laughs> I have too many weapons in the house. <laughs> and she knows how to use them. Honey, I love you, but you know, I met the sweetest little girl last time I was out in Belize, and she's so nice, got the cutest little accent. And I, I kind of love her too. Boom! <laughs> My problems have been solved. Or at least wounded, but we won't even go there. Anyway, <laughs> that's a deception. It's deception. You know why people, why the deception comes? Because when we sin like this, automatically we are, we have this feeling and this sense this overpowering sense of guilt. God made us that way. So what do we do? Instead of just confessing, we do everything but confess. We, well, I, it's my husband's fault. If he took better care of me, if my wife's fault, she took care of me, and, and all the, it, it's somebody else's fault. That's the culture we live in, isn't it? Blame somebody for my failure. You need to take responsibility for your failure and realize that if you sin, you sin, you need to get it right with God. Another lie is this, you know, no one will ever know. <laughs> Well, I tell you, that's, that's not the truth. Proverbs 5 says it this way. The Lord sees clearly what a man does and examines every path he takes. And that's within the context of immorality, by the way. Job 24, verse 15 says, The adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No one's going to see me. And he hides his face when no one know him. I'll put on my shades. I'll put on my cap. You know, somebody put on a hat. You know, I'll dress a little different. Nobody's going to know who I am. Listen, the Bible makes it clear there's nothing hid from the eyes of God from whom we have to do with. Nothing hid from God. And sooner or later, the Bible says, Beware your sin will find you out. You're going to be caught in the shame and the horror and the distraction. It's, it's just the nature of these kind of things. So understand, you know, and there's a long life. There's another, some I didn't put here. One of my favorites was this one, and I didn't put it on this. It's God wants me to be happy. God wants you to be right with him. That's what God, we call that holy, all right? God wants you to be filled with life. God wants you to be filled with joy. And you can't experience that when you're living for yourself and living in sin. It's just not going to happen. It's deception. It's a delusion, and you're believing a lie. The third thing I want to catch about this, uh, the whole idea of adultery is, is the demonic movement, of, you know, the satanic movement, the inspiration of it. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, this is written to believers, be of a sober spirit. And that's to do, be, learn how to think right. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, all these warnings that we see like this in Scripture in the New Testament are all written to believers. In other words, Satan looks at you as a target, and the moment you think you would never do that, that's where he'll hit you at. The moment you think, well, I'd never do that, I'm not, I'm not going to expose myself to that, it would never happen to me, you know, I'm serious about my relationship, Satan will target you right away. We need to always realize that outside Jesus Christ, we are vulnerable. We are easy to take down. That's why we always put on Jesus. That's why we put on the mind of Christ. That's why we seek to be filled with the Spirit daily. That's why we trust the Lord and believe His Word every day. The Bible tells us in James 1, each one is tempted. Everybody's tempted. And we're tempted when we're carried away and enticed by our own lust. The real word here is those desires. And when the desires concede, what's it do? You choose to do the desire that's wrong, that God forbidden one, then it brings forth sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. How can you have a relationship filled with death? You can't. Death always divides. 
kind of sounds like this when we talk about the devil roaring about like a roaring lion. In Proverbs 6, it says, by means of a horse woman, a uh, man is brought to a piece of bread and catches, but the adulterer, the adulteress, they will hunt for the precious life. Someone who's possessed in this kind of area in their life and Satan's ruling the, this part of their life and r running rampant in this area of their life. They don't have their morality in check. They're not really submitting their heart and their minds and their to the Lord to be clean and holy before God. And Satan is always manipulating those kind of people. And they're out there to destroy somebody else's life, not only their own. We hear it today, um, every time you turn on the news, there's some person you hear about, some new Hollywood actor, someone who's, who's addicted in, to, to sexual sins. And they don't call them sins, we just call it a sexual addiction. We don't call any of these things sin, by the way, anymore. We don't call drunkenness, drunkenness, you know. We don't call, you know, homosexuality, what the Bible calls it. We don't call, we don't adultery these things. They're just, you know, they're just, you know, problems, hang-ups, you know, diseases. And we'll deal with these by taking 12 simple steps and have our disease dealt with. And people stay in bondage. There's a strange spiritual addiction, I believe, that comes with sins of immorality. I do believe the Bible talks about certain things. And even if you read the book of Revelation, it talks about how in the end times, people will be drunk on fornication. In Revelation chapter 17, I believe it is, that there's, there's a drunkenness. There's, it, you know, it, the mind and the body is a unique thing. God made us the way he made us, as I said earlier. And when we, when we choose to satisfy these desires and drives, it always brings life. But people who are in bondage, they're not experiencing life. They're, 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 they're in bondage to all kinds of, of, of immorality and perversions in their life. And it's not freedom that they're experiencing in their life because they chose their will over God's will. And the thing about it is they experience these little short bursts of pleasure in their perversions and in, the, in their immorality. And they think that's happiness. And it's not. It's misery. In fact, we know those triggers within the mind, the, the chemical triggers of dopamine and, and those kind of things that happen that people get addicted to. But really, we just think it's all physical. When it's not physical at all, it all gets back to the spiritual and what Satan's trying to do to manipulate somebody's life to continue to live the kind of life that's, that's, that's destroying their life. Which brings me to the fourth point, the destruction of adultery. This is Satan's goal, obviously. So he's behind manipulating people and manipulating events. And you need to be cautious. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 23, the commandment, in other words, the word that God gives is a lamp. Its teaching is light. The reproofs for discipline are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelids. Now it goes on in verse 26. For on the account of a harlot, one is reduced to this loaf of bread. We read this a while ago. The adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Now, in those verses, he talks about an adulterous woman, and he talks about an adulterous man, and he talks about how they're there, their lives are empty, and wherever they go, they create other chaos and more emptiness in other people's lives. And whoever goes that path is, it's not going to be without judgment. It's not going to be without punishment. Remember, sin, the wages of sin is what? Death. Sin is death. If I choose to live in sin, it creates death. If I choose to eat donuts all day long, every day, it creates fat, which creates heart attack, which creates every other problem in life, right? It's the same thing. When you choose to rebel against God, there's, this, there's that simple, you know, law of harvest and operation. You reap what you sow. And if I choose to live this way, then I'm going to have to be recompensed all the stuff that goes along with it. There may be this little pleasure for a moment, but the misery, the pain. We talked about Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 last week. Remember the list I showed you at the end of the message? Went over it real quickly. But all the damage that comes from a life that chooses to live in immorality, all the problems from your children to your spouse to, to your job to your finances to your home to your future, your relationship to the Lord. It was David who said, Lord... And it's sin, it's a sin of immorality, the sin of adultery. Lord, I've sinned against you. I can't take this anymore. This heaviness, this pain, it's like a heavy burden over me. And he, you see his complaint as well as his confession. And many times we focus on the confession, but maybe we need to focus on the complaint and the heartache and the death that poured out of that sin, that poured out of that disobedience. There's nothing that is good that will come from adultery. There's nothing that is good that can come out of a premarital sexual relationship. There's nothing that is good that can come out of homosexuality. Nothing but pain and heartache. Why? Because the wages of sin has not been affected by recession or inflation. It's still death. 
across the board. So let me give you some final words of wisdom as we close this message out. And I know this could be a whole series of sermons. The roots of the feet adultery are deep and they're multifaceted. But remember behind it all is the enemy seeking to destroy our lives. I mean, sometimes it's, it's selfishness. Sometimes it's anger within a relationship, bitterness, neediness, a critical spouse, uh, some other person hunting for the precious life and somebody, you know, thinking it's all about love and it's really all about lust. Verse 32 from Proverbs, we read earlier about that, that if you choose to go this route, you lack understanding. So let me give you some actions, some things that you should avoid in, in, in your walk and in your relationship as a married couple. Number one, to avoid would be this, is pornography. That should go without saying. And like I say, we're going to deal with a message on this specifically. But there's more pornography around us than what we, you, you can just go to the internet and find. There, there, there's pornographic scenes on primetime TV on the major networks at night now. All right? There are pornographic scenes in commercials. I mean, all you got to do is watch a Victoria's Secret commercial on TV. That's nothing but blatant pornography. It has desire for, it's just there for one thing, to stir up an appetite, to stir, arouse somebody in a sexual way. So it's all around us. So we need to learn to avoid it. It's in the movies. And, you know, like I said, the Magic Mike show or the Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a trilogy, by the way. Kind of like, you know, the Twilight series. It captured a generation of young people. This is capturing a generation of women. All right? To destroy their lives. Another thing is worldly mindedness. What do you mean? You cannot embrace the context or the belief system, the philosophy that the world embraces. That everything's okay. It really just make it a meaningful relationship. Or we're consenting adults. Don't you love that terminology? It's just junk. It's behind it all is just death and pain and sorrow. You've got to avoid this worldly mindset. And unfortunately, if all you do is absorb the world's media the TV, the music industry, the movie industry, if that's your source of constant irritation, eight to 10 hours a day, then you're going to embrace the world's attitude towards it. I know Christians were firmly dead set against some of this stuff at one time in life, but now they sit and watch all these little sitcoms that, that embrace this kind of stuff and you know, laugh about it. When it's just blatant ungodliness and immorality and worldly mindedness. God says, you know, don't love the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man chooses to love the world, the love of the Father's not in him. So who are we going to love? Another thing to avoid is not just worldly mindedness in our relationships, it's comparison. You don't need to be comparing your wife or your husband with somebody else's spouse. God gave you who you gave you. Well, she changed since I married her. Well, you probably changed her. <laughs> you didn't take care of her. You didn't help her. You didn't help him. You didn't take care of him. You didn't, so many times it's, we just sit back and we kind of compare. Hey, everybody looks good at 9 o'clock on Monday morning on Sunday morning. Go, with them, go back to their house a few hours before that when the breath stinks and their hair's all messed up, there's no mascara, there's no makeup, there's no rouge, you know, there's no fine clothing. It's just, you know, it's a different world. Don't be comparing. Number four is unresolved disputes. You know, if you avoid damaging words, bleeding to bitterness. It destroys so many couples and so many relationships. Let the words of your mouth be acceptable in the sight of God. Another one, is, and all these are sermons themselves, as I said, is opportunity. Say, what do you mean? Minimize the opportunities. You know, if you don't want to get stung by bees, stay away from the beehive. You know, don't, don't make sure your, your, your friends that you hang with are as committed to their marriage as you are. Make sure the people you, your closest relationships are committed to the same kind of standards you are. In the workplace, if you're there, you be careful in the workplace. Like I say, everybody looks good at work. They dressed well. No curlers, you know, none of this other stuff. You don't see them at their worst when their spouse does. Number six would be, thing to avoid is improper relationships. Most affairs occur between close friends, coworkers, family members. So what we should do is to do what? We should maintain proper relationship. The way to do that, listen, husbands, Wives, do not listen, even if they're close friends, do not listen to the opposite sex tell you about how bad their marriage is. That is an open invitation. Women, don't go fishing for compliments. If you're not getting them at home, then don't go out looking for them outside your relationship. Only your husband can meet those deep emotional needs in your life. No one else can. God's designed it that way. And men, don't be giving compliments in such a regard to get attention. Another thing is just avoid those kind of those lingering stares. If you're here today and you're single, hey, you know, a lingering stare never hurt anybody. If you're ready for marriage and you're looking for the right person. Now, don't be ridiculous and don't be trying to stir up an appetite in somebody. 
but to get somebody's attention. You don't need to be doing that if you're married. Prolonged stares or touching is very, you've heard me talk about this in, in sermons about how we need to be careful how we hug. Gentlemen, if you're here and you greet these ladies in this church with these full frontal hugs, shame on you. Come on. Women, the same way, shame on you. And look how quiet it got. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? You know what's wrong with that. Get your life, get your act together. That's somebody's wife. You hug my wife like that, and I said, I'm going to compound you. I'm serious. I'll backslide. <laughs> Briefly, but long enough. For you get the message. The Bible talks about that very clearly. There are some things you not do. That's that, the negative, the positive, the positive. Here's some things you can do. 1 Corinthians 7 puts it this way. To avoid fornication, have your own wife. Let every husband have her own husband. Let the husband render the wife due benevolence and likewise to his, the wife to the husband. The wife doesn't have power over her own body, but the husband. And the husband doesn't have power over his own body, but the wife. In other words, you are one. You take care of each other's needs. Don't defraud it. In other words, don't keep away from each other in a conjugal way only for a brief moment in time, a brief period of, of, of time, so maybe a time committed to fasting or to prayer or physical, some things going on, but nonetheless, you come together again so you won't be tempted by Satan. Yeah. If you're the kind of wife or the kind of husband who likes to use sex as a weapon, get your heart right and get your life right. God never intended that to be a weapon in your life, <laughs> but a blessing in your life. How, what do you do in this regard? Seek to build oneness in your life. Seek to build a deeper relationship. Come together, he's saying here, in a physical relationship, render benevolence, conjugal, build each other up, I think is part of this, this rendering ben this act of benevolence and not just a physical thing. Be transparent in your relationship with your spouse. And let me wrap it up with this verse about what it says in Proverbs chapter 5. Drink water out of your own well, your own cistern, running waters out of your own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad in the rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not a stranger's with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her be as the loving hind, the pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee all times and to be thou ravished always with her love. Now the King, New King James Version may say it a, a little milder than that, but the idea is there. Gentlemen, ladies, you have a marriage relationship to satisfy these drives and these desires in. And that's where it's going to be, that's where it's going to be a blessing. That's where it can be a, a benefit. That's where it can be fruitful. That's where it can be meaningful. There's only one person, sir, that can satisfy this desire in your life without pain, without sorrow, without death, without misery, without destruction, and that's your spouse. Same there, ladies. And you, need to, you need to realize the value. The Bible says, possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. It's also a word written to husbands. You need to realize how valuable your wife is to you in this regard as well as in all the other regards. This is a serious issue. And maybe you're sitting here today and your, your life hasn't been touched by this or, you know, and, and, but yet you're, you're in a place of a great vulnerability because you're not paying attention to the one that's in your life, the, the, the partner that you have. Your marriage can be exciting. Your marriage can be blessing. Your marriage can be beneficial. Your marriage can be fruitful. Your marriage can be the, 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 the testimony to your children that God intends it to be. Your, li your life together can be rich. It can be rewarding. That's one of the reasons we have our marriage conference every year. We've been doing it for almost as long as the church has been going. Every year. You know, but yeah, I see, I've seen couples over the years, we don't need to go to that, or we've been once before, we've been, hey, there's, there's just something about going to that conference this year to refresh your mind, to restore those principles in your mind, to check, you know, you'd be surprised me if people just come, every year God's doing something unique and taking them to a, a whole different level. You know, you can never go to enough marriage seminars and marriage conferences. You need that kind of accountability, you need that kind of understanding, any kind of leadership, because left to ourselves with no accountability, we always lead ourselves to the well of ruin instead of the well of life. We have one coming up in October, and this I wasn't planning to do a commercial announcement, but I am making one. You pay attention to what's in the bulletin. You make some time. You get some time together. You nurture your relationship. The Bible makes that clear over and over and over again about nurturing your relationship, ministering one another, washing each other with the water of the Word. And this is a fantastic and a glorious way to do it. Maybe you're here today, and these thoughts of adultery have been running through your heart and mind because we're all targets, dear friends. And it's hopefully today you've seen the damages that you could open your life up to. Maybe you're here today and this is your life. And you're sitting there saying, with, 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 filled with a sense of condemnation perhaps or shame or guilt. You need to sense that. That's a natural warning sign. You need to embrace it and say, God, I am sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse my heart. I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to live that life. 
You know, 1 John tells us there, all, there is forgiveness. Praise God. Thank God. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You understand that confession means not just to admit it, but it means to forsake it. It means to agree with God about it. God said no, I say no. God said turn, I say turn. God said repent, I repent. Whatever God says, that means to confess. I would trust today that you let this message simmer in your heart and mind. Because nothing good will ever come into your life, or your marriage, or your home going this route. I pray you have ears to hear and eyes to see. You know, God's given us the perfect illustration with His Son, Jesus, when he, we became, the church became the bride. Jesus is faithful through all eternity. We need to be that kind of spouse, faithful to the very end. Would you stand with your heads bowed?